Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's event. Gardening in your own backyard. My name is Jose and I'm a librarian with LA County Library. I want to remind everybody that your mics and videos will be disabled for the duration of the event. This is just to make the event run a little bit smoother. If you have any questions or comments for the presenter, please put them in the chat. Address it to all panelists and I'll be sure to try to include them at the appropriate time or during a Q&A at the end. Now, before we get started, I do want to remind everybody that our spring and summer discovery program has started and it runs now through August 8th. Each month, uh, participants are encouraged to log in the books that they've read, take on some great challenges, and each month that you compete, you'll be eligible to win some great prizes. Now, how do you participate? Well, you could sign up online. You can also stop by one of our uh, one of our libraries, which are now reopened for limited in-person service. We are very excited to be open um, and ready to serve you once again in the library. So stop by if you've missed the libraries. Um, we've missed you seeing you in the libraries. Um, so please, please stop by. Um, and don't forget uh, to check out all our other great uh, virtual programs by going to alleycountylibrary.org slash virtual dash program. Now, uh, for today's presentation, like I said, we'll be doing gardening in your own backyard. I know many of us took up this this hobby during during this mess of quarantine that we have. We were locked down. We had nothing to do, so we started to garden. Some of us knew what we were doing. Some of us made it along, um, just made it up as we went, went along. Um, so, if you want some great tips, we have a great expert here today, Ms. Finfin. Over to you. Thank you, Jose. Um, welcome, and I I really am very um, one of the positives of this entire unfortunate lockdown for the year is that a lot of people have gotten into gardening and gardening is uh, it's a very fantastic it's a very healthy sort of hobby I just wanted to talk a little bit about the University of California um, cooperative extension as well as the master gardener program before I get started um, the the University of California uh, master program it's a public service and outreach program under the University of California Agricultural and Natural Resources. And you know, we are passionate volunteers that partner with the University of California to distribute hopefully scientifically proven methods of gardening and pest management to the public at large. Um, at the end of my talk, I'll give you a couple of emails if you have questions that you can contact us. Um, so today I, I apologize, I wasn't able to figure out the WebEx to show you my face, but um, luckily um, we can, we can all look at the slides as I go along. So next slide. So farming, um, you know, we began our civilization, it's rooted in farming. And so at the beginning, everyone was a farmer. So it's thought to have begun, I think in the Fertile Crescent, which is a region in the Middle East, including modern day Iraq, Jordan, Syria, Israel, Palestine, Southeastern Turkey and Western Iran. And the US, um, I want to mention today because today is June 19th. It's we have a special history where we did actually have slaves in the United States. And when President Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation to free all the slaves in 1862, um, it was really difficult to enforce. And um, I guess two years later, around June 19th, it was in Texas that I think all of the slaves were were officially freed. And so we celebrate this. I think there will be a public holiday um, coming up in the following years. Um, but people started farming and a lot of people, they farmed as their family had farmed. So, you know, if you knew that there was a good variety of corn, you knew that you passed it along to your sons and daughters. Um, and if you knew like, oh, this day we, we plant in May and we don't plant in June. However, as um, the industrial revolution happened, people moved into cities and farming equipment took over and a lot of the farming techniques were forgotten. Next slide. Um, as a big part, unfortunately, and fortunately during the world wars, when people started uh, going to war and then there was all the food had to be sent to soldiers, people, um, the government started encouraging people, especially in the United States to grow their own food. And um, if you have grandparents that were here in the US during 1930s, the 1920s and 30s and 40s, um, they'll remember those posters for these victory gardens, encouraging everyone to grow their own food, to compost by, you know, in, in order to reduce the food wastes. And um, so people actually had these things that are called victory gardens. Um, next slide. Oh. 
And so there was a number of increasing number of phone calls from home gardeners. And the Master Gardener program was kind of started in around 1972 to 1981 because there was just an increased need to know, oh, because I didn't have, you know, my grandparents didn't have, uh, didn't tell me how to do farming because I had lived in a city. Like, you know, the questions, how do you grow a tomato? How do you grow a cucumber? Was it worthwhile to grow, you know, was it worthwhile to grow peas? Um, and so it began in 1981 and it's continued on to almost 100 master gardeners um, in the Los Angeles County. And if you sort of, um, especially in the public library, if you see the Grow LA Victory Garden Initiative, which helps new gardeners start their own gardens quickly and easily, um, those are run by the Master Gardener Program. Next slide. So the need for growing vegetables is, I mean, I guess this is an old statistic actually from before the pandemic. It's before, even before the pandemic um, happened and everyone had to stay home, there's 42 million American households, which is like about 35% who grow a little bit of their own food. You know, all, not all of your food, but you know, some of us tried growing lettuce and some carrots, some tomatoes. Tomatoes are especially popular in California because we have a nice dry climate, which I'll talk about a little bit later. It's up 17% in five years. And there's been a 200% increase, uh, percent increase in community gardens. Um, these are actually gardens, like large plots, almost like uh, public parks, where you can, you can uh, reserve your own plot of garden if you don't if you live in an apartment and you you know wanted a bigger space besides containers you can actually apply to these community gardens and for a small fee each year you can actually have a plot that you can grow with anything you want next slide so a question came in asking um how would you access these community gardens so is there a list someone could look at um or what's the best way to to see if there's one near your home there is a list um if you just put in your zip code and also the word community garden. I know there's a few in Pasadena. There's definitely um, a lot in the Valley. And um, yeah, I think if you, and if you can't find it, um, there's, I think a list, a private list on the Master Gardener website. And so you could contact me and um, ask if you couldn't find it just by searching. Well, thank you. Um, so how do gardens impact food security and health? Well, I guess if you are attending here and wanting to grow a garden or have been growing gardens, you know, there's fresh vegetables are amazing. I mean, if you go to Whole Foods or, you know, I, I guess if, uh, I don't go to Whole Foods, but if you guys go to Whole Foods, you know that the fresh, delicious heirloom tomato is always, it's huge. It's like $10 or something insane. However, if you grew it at your home and, you know, you could get one of those tomatoes every day or you know, every other day from June to August. And so this leads, if you have an excess in your home, this leads to greater fruit and vegetable consumption by the household. And um, one of the things I really love about gardening is that sometimes you have an excess and you, that's when you get to meet your neighbors and you say, hi, you know, I'm next door, would you like some tomatoes or cucumbers? Um, and most people are very happy to, to you know, take, on, take on your extra. So you sort of share uh, you share your abundance with your with your neighborhood. In addition, I also work in a school um, school garden, and if you have kids, and some of the kids, you know, they're not they're a little bit shy about the you know the the more bitter green vegetables. Is that there's an increased preference for consumption, or at least willingness to try fruits and vegetables if you made them yourself, if you planted them and grew them and took care of them yourself. And I see this at the beginning in the fall and September where we have the kids come over and um, I just sort of make sure I see a couple of the kids who are a little bit scared of, you know, say kale, which has a bitter, slightly bitter taste. And so as they're growing it throughout the year, um, you can see the kids who are like very enthusiastic about eating. You can see the, the, the more shyer kids as they, as they start seeing their peers eat the kale, you give the the shy kids a little bit the tip of the kale which is actually the least bitter and so they try them and by may and by by the end of may basically everyone's fighting for the kale and you know it's actually really one of those fun things where um i always laugh when the people or the kids are like hey she got a bigger kale than i did and piece of kale than i did um 
So it's really, uh, it's, it's really, uh, the more you are used to exposed to something, the more you're willing to try it and the more you, you like it. All right, next slide. And there's other benefits of gardening that we don't think of, but you know, you don't need a gym membership if you're carting, <laughs> you're carting bags of soil and you're turning over um, the soil with a shovel and you're walking every day to go water. And there's also mental and health therapeutic benefits to gardening. Just getting outside each day and getting a little bit of sun, um, seeing your garden grow, feeling a sense of you know, connection to nature has been um, shown to have very, very beneficial effects just on the mental and therapeutic health of humans. And if you tend to grow, you know, even the weeds. So this is a picture of the dandelion. They, even as you're tending to the garden and, you know, everything, everything um, that you do to help grow something, it does really benefit the environment as a whole. All right, next slide. So this is um this is a beginner I'm gonna do quickly just in case uh, you haven't gotten started yet, and you say, well, how do I get started? So the th there's three major things that you have to do when you when you uh, before you get started gardening is you have to make three decisions. Um, you need to know if there's a space for planting, which is okay if you live in an apartment, if you don't have a lot of space, um, as long as you have access to a little bit of sun, you can have container gardening. Or perhaps you are renting a house, or you know have a house with a backyard, in which case, uh, or you have a and it's there's it's covered by weeds or lawn. You can do this thing called lasagna gardening, which I'll talk about later, um, where you just smother the weeds, or you can like dig them out or smother them. Um, or if you want to sort of have a long term, this is like the most costly um, option, but it's actually a quite it's quite good option if you're very serious about gardening, as you can build a raised bed, which is like in the picture. Or you can fill it with your own soil and you can and so you can be sure that it has the right mix and it has the right you know amount of of you know nutrients that you want to optimize your growing um, the second one is seeds or seedlings depending on the time of year and how much patience you have you can start um, you can start your plants from seeds or you can go to the you know you can go to the local uh, hardware shop i think lowe's um, or the gardening center such as Green Thumb um, or your local gardening center to buy the seedlings. So I'll talk about that in terms of cost and ease of use. And of course, you gotta make sure that very similar to having a pet, um, your garden is a little bit like a pet. Uh, you're gonna need a little bit of time and you're gonna need a little bit of patience when you're growing your garden. Um, you can't just put the seed in the ground and then run off and have like a, you know, and not see it for, for three or four months, although you can do that as uh, after a couple of years. Uh, so it's hard in the beginning, but it's very rewarding as you continue on. Next slide. So the first one I talked about is space. Um, as I mentioned, for raised beds, if you see in the picture, they are sort of, if you go to the community gardens, they have raised beds for you. You can build your own to save them a lot of money, or there are uh, prefabricated ones that you can just buy at the local hardware shop where you just sort of you know unfold it and you put it down and you fill it with your own soil this does cost um, a lot of money in terms of you have to get soil you have to put it in um, but it has it gives you the most amount of control so you can control what goes in you can control what kind of nutrients you put in um, for the los angeles area we tend to have very clay hard soil if you've ever tried to dig into your you know, into the ground, it almost feels like concrete in the in the summer, and you almost have to wait until winter after the rains um, before you can really make a dent in there. So for raised beds, it's very soft. You you know, it's you know you can start planting right away. You don't have to prepare the soil. The second one is lasagna gardening, and this is if you have a lawn and you have you know unkillable grass. So what you can do is you can actually you know do a little bit of digging up the lawn, but what you can do is if you have those cardboard containers or you have newspapers or you know um, junk mail, you can just put it in there and just smother all the weeds and then for the summer, and then you can actually do a little bit, just put, you know, put some bags of soil on top of it and you've got a garden right there as, you know, right there already. For um, those of you that live, you know, in places where they don't have, you don't have access to a, 
a piece of ground that's not uh, covered in concrete, you can do container gardening. And this is actually very successful for herbs, very successful for lettuce, carrots, radishes. Um, I've known people that grow large plants such as broccoli and even tomatoes, if you get the smaller varieties, very successfully. And it doesn't have to be a container that you purchase. You can actually be very creative. So I have another picture where someone decided to use their yogurt cans and they decided to use um, you know, their, their milk cartons to grow strawberries. Strawberries are very small plants. They're very compact. Um, and you don't, they don't need a lot of, they don't need a very deep soil. So uh, you, you can definitely be very creative in finding materials to grow your plants in. Next slide. So a uh, couple, uh, one question that's come in multiple times um, by multiple people, the, you know, talking about creativity, how can we get creative watering our plants given our current drought situation and how much water some of these plants might need to grow? Do you have any tips on how to limit the water usage? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I personally use something called a drip system. So it's um, instead of watering, a lot of the times when you water um, with a hose, most of the water, it's surprisingly, um, what happens with the soil, it's, there's a term called hydrophobic, which means that it's scared of water. Um, when the soil completely dries out, you'll notice that sometimes when you have houseplants and you're watering it, and you're watering and watering and watering it, and the soil is completely bone dry. It's actually when the soil finally dries out, it's actually, it, the water almost goes straight through. And so when I use a drip system or very slow watering, um, this is where, where it drips like, you know, one, one or two drops a little bit for about an hour. Um, that does sort of help uh, reduce the amount of water. Um, another way to do this, it's not, you can't do it right now, but um, you could sort of prepare for it for the winter is that um, I have rain barrels. And what you can do is for rain barrels, you can connect it to a gutter on a roof and you can collect the rain water. And, you know, Los Angeles actually has a huge amount of water, believe it or not. And what happened was that because there was a giant amount of floods back in the, I think, 70s, um, the city actually designed is designed to have all the water run into the ocean. And so during those really heavy rains that are like going on for one hour or so, you can collect hundreds of gallons of water if you have a rain barrel. Um, a rain barrel is typically about 60 to 100 gallons. And if you have four or five of those, you can yeah. you can collect quite a lot of that. And um, the third one is, this one's a little bit hard because if you're growing, um, you're growing vegetables for food, is that you have to be very careful about this, is that we also use something called gray water. Um, gray water is something where you're like, you're taking a shower, you're washing your dishes, you know, so the water has a little bit of soap, a little bit of food and other things, um, perhaps bacteria. And I just, we actually run it to water our roses, um, but you know, you can use that. You just have to be a little bit careful. So if you're, um, because it could kill your vegetables because they're a little bit sensitive. Um, so if you use your wash water from your washing machine, for example, there are certain detergents you can purchase that would um, that wouldn't be too toxic for your plants. Um, I think that's the three things I can think of that would help us in this drought. That's a good question. That was a fantastic answer. Thank you so much. Um, for starting seeds, so it's funny. Um, one of the biggest one of the biggest um, comments I get from people is that, oh, you know, I put some seeds in the ground and nothing came up. And oftentimes it's actually because not all seeds are created equal. Some seeds require very deep planting. Some seeds take forever to come up and you just, you know, you didn't watch it long enough. And so the first thing you do when you get a seed packet, if you're gonna start from seeds is to read directions from the front and the back. Um, so you have the packages of seeds, say you have beets and it says, either first off it says in the back, it says either full sun or shade. And um, so you gotta make sure that you're not planting it. You know, you're not planting your tomato in the shade and you're not planting you know, a shade loving plant in the sun because when they come up immediately, if it's not right for them, um, plants, to, <laughs> plants don't talk, but they can tell you that they're unhappy by dying. And um, 
if a plant dies, it's um, you don't have to feel like you're failing. You just have to be like, oh, I guess it just wasn't in the right place. Um, and so one of the things that I get a lot of comments about is like, I can never grow carrots. And carrots are sort of, to me, one of the more easiest low maintenance vegetables. And that's because for a carrot, if you turn over a package of seeds for a carrot, it says uh, for radishes, it's like seven days. So when you put the seed in the ground seven days a week, you'll be like, okay, I see it. Um, for the carrots, um, it's like 20 days. So you might have to wait an entire month of watering and not seeing anything until the, the carrot actually germinates or sprouts the seeds germinate. And you finally get the two little leaves that come out. And then for a carrot to mature, it actually takes almost three months. And so that, um, if you guys have ever read the small book, list in the children's book, the carrot seed, where the little boy waits and waits and waits and waits, and everyone told him it's not going to come up. And at the very end, it finally comes up. That is actually, <laughs> it's very, uh, it's a very truthful a rendition of how you feel, how I feel about carrots is that they, it takes a long time for them to come. It takes a long time for them to mature. Um, but, you know, if you just keep watering and just believing in it, they, they're actually really one of the most lowest maintenance and pest-free vegetables to grow. All right, next slide. On the, on the question of patience and uh, waiting, there, is, there are benefits of getting seeds versus seedlings. So for seeds, the, the benefits are that it's cheaper and it's more plentiful. For a package of seeds for, I don't know, a dollar or two dollars, you can get a hundred plants if you are, you know, willing to take the time. Unfortunately, it does take a long time and you have to care for the seedlings. Uh, plants such as tomatoes, if you wanted to start your tomatoes and you wanted to grow them so that you get tomatoes right now in June from seed, you would actually have had to plant the seeds in January. <laughs> so, um, and it takes, you know, it does take a long time. Whereas um, if you want to put this tomato plant in the ground right now, you can go and buy a seedling, which is about, you know, one foot tall. And you can put it in the ground and still get your tomatoes in August. But if you were to plant tomato seeds right now, you wouldn't get tomatoes probably until December. And then um, just because it's not at the right time, um, tomatoes, they need about 80 degrees Fahrenheit to um, set flower and also set fruit. And so a lot of people, when they grow tomatoes in starting in October, they ask, oh, my plant is really thriving. It's beautiful and it's green, but I'm not getting any tomatoes. And it's just at the wrong time of year. Um, so the vegetables that start from seeds are typically peas, carrots. Those don't get moved very well. So if you go to and buy a six pack of seedlings of carrots and you try to put them in the ground, you usually end up with kind of misshapen carrots just because, um, you know, that if they get moved, carrots are very sensitive. And so you'll get those funny shapes, you know, like uh, looks like two, uh, two carrots and then some, you know, other shapes of carrots. And then peas are also a little bit sensitive about transplanting. For seedlings, they're already started for you. So the plants are larger and they're more resistant. Um, I'll talk a little bit about pests that are in the garden, but sometimes, you know, like if a grasshopper came and just ate, you know, parts of your tomato, you don't want it to eat. You know, if, you, if it's just uh, one inch long and the grasshopper eats all of it, then it dies. But if it's, you know, it's a foot big and the grasshopper eats one leaf, then the tomato plant will be fine. Um, the cons of it are it's more expensive and you don't get as much. So a six pack, you only get six plants. Um, and then vegetables to start as seedlings. I like to do, this is sort of my own personal opinion and um, not part of the Master Gardener uh, program is that I personally, from my experience of gardening in Los Angeles, I, I typically like to start um, tomatoes, herbs, and other things that I failed to start as seeds, um, I like to buy them as a six pack and then just put them in the ground and not have to worry about them. Next slide. So we do have a question about, about the seeds. Um, do, do they go bad? How long can you keep seeds before putting them in the ground? Is there a way to store them to secure that they don't go bad? If, if oh. seeds go bad? Oh, that's a really great question. Um, if you are saving seeds just straight from the plant, 
typically about one year if you keep it in a dark and cold environment. Like don't put it in your garage that's uninsulated and gets to 120 in the summer. Um, in the seed packets that you buy from the store, they often have an expiration date. But what the expiration date just tells you is that um, by that date, usually 90% of the seeds will germinate, will be successful in at least sprouting, if not surviving. But they'll, you know, they'll at least open up and they'll start their um, their first roots and their first cotyledons, their first true leaves. Um, however, you can, I've used seed packets that are like five to six years old, and I don't get a high percentage of germination or success, but you know, if you have a hundred seeds and 50 of them take, you know, it's pretty good still. Um, definitely try to store your seeds in a dark, cool place. That's where they will, and dry place, that's usually where they will store the longest. Um, also, if you're collecting seeds and your plant is a little bit um, overrun with pests, what I like to do, and you have to determine on how sensitive your seeds are. If they're really tiny, um, it's not too bad, but if they're a little bit big and fleshy, you want to be a little bit careful as I like to sort of put them in the freezer for about like one hour or, or two hours, because that sort of kills all the bugs you know, because the bugs will freeze and, and then, but the seeds will still be actually quite, um, quite viable. All right, one to plant. So Los Angeles, we are really blessed with um, a wonderful climate. I know um, sometimes we're on fire and it's not ideal. However, our climate allows us to grow almost 300 and, you know, 50 days out of the year. It's similar to places like Italy, which is why tomatoes, um, if they're, the tomatoes are an American plant, but they definitely are grown very well. They love this Mediterranean, lots of sunshine, slightly dry climate. And a lot of the herbs, um, herbs grow very well as well. You can grow, um, you can grow almost any plant, almost any time of the year in California. And we are really, really lucky for that. There's a specific time where you can grow plants that are where they will do the best and they will be the most op they will produce the most amount of fruit. But um, just because of the amount of sunshine that we have and the the sort of generous, somewhat dry uh, climate, we are actually able to grow a lot of things without um, a lot of the rot and the um, the viruses and the and the fungus that sort of plague a lot of other places. Um, Generally, the schedule for a Mediterranean climate works well. So you would put in, sometimes when you see the seed packet, it says put in after the last frost. You know, last frost for us is never. <laughs> so we can actually plant in January, February. And um, we can also do a second crop in September. Next slide. So this is just sort of a rule of thumb. And, you know, um, for June, since we are we're in June right now, is that you can put in right now beets, chard, sweet potatoes, pumpkins, and tomatoes, which is a little bit late, but um, as if you baby them along through, throughout the hot season, you can still definitely get um, some fruits out of it. For pumpkins, if you actually, there's a, it's funny, there's a little uh, side bit is that if you wanted to get pumpkins for Halloween, you most people, uh, such as farms, such as Underwood Farms, they plant them in July 4th. So if you plant them on July 4th, you'll get pumpkins for Halloween. The best time though, I really love winters in Los Angeles, is that around the end of September towards October is a time to plant the spring crops that most people plant, you know, in the rest of the US plant in the spring. So if you put in kales, peas, carrots, radishes, and, and the delicate leafy vegetables like spinach, um, yeah, you you'll get you'll get vegetables, you know, all the way through winter. And they will, especially kale, once it gets a little cold, um, it, somehow the first frost will actually sweeten the kale a bit. I also forgot, um, now is a good time to put in basil if you can. Basil is a sun-loving plant. It's very happy in the summer. Next slide. And so even though I said um, California and Los Angeles is a wonderful Mediterranean climate and you can plant anything all year, um, there are some caveats. So 
why not plant broccoli? And he's like, I love broccoli. Why not plant broccoli, cauliflower? Why, <laughs> um, why not plant radishes? It's because this picture right here, it's a picture of my broccoli. And what happens is that once you get above 90, 95 for a few days, it tells uh, broccoli has a signal and a lot of the, a lot of the, the flowering vegetables such as um, broccoli and kale, it tells the plant, oh, I guess it's time to set seed. And so what the broccoli does is it's actually the head that we eat is a giant flower. And so it bursts out into bloom. And this is what you get um, in terms of, you can still eat it, but it's, uh, it's no longer, it doesn't look like broccoli anymore. Next slide. Oh, I guess I forgot to mention pests as well. Also in the summer, um, just to, could I go back one slide? Thanks. I forgot also in summer there, because uh, Los Angeles is sometimes windy and very dusty, you might have some problems with these very tiny things called spider mites. And what those are is that if you look at your plant and you've been watering it and you know, you've done everything right, but it still looks like it's doing poorly as if it's drying out. And then you see this webbing on it, sort of like as if there were spiders making webs on it. And you see these little red dots, those are spider mites and they tend to be the worst in the summer because um, usually they reproduce, you know, every few days, but in the summer, the hotter it gets, the faster they reproduce. And so in, the, in August, they're almost, if you have spider mites in your garden, you'll know because they're just everywhere. Um, in the winter, they seem to be under control because they're, they, they, um, they reproduce a lot more slower and then the predators come in and finish them off. All right, next slide. So waiting is hard. And even I, after 10 years of gardening, I have a hard time. When I put the seed in the ground, I wanna see it come up. And what you wanna do is, especially if you have um, children or if you're working with um, a first time gardeners, you, you, I wanna see some results. And so what you wanna do is you can stagger your seeds. And what you can do is, because we know from the seed packets that radishes come up in seven days, but then carrots come up in 20 days, and then peas are in the middle. So peas come up in like, I guess, between 10 to 15 days, is that you can plant them all at once. And that's sort of what I do. I plant a row of radishes, and then in between the rows, I plant the carrots. And then in between those rows, staggered in, I plant the peas. And so what happens is that one week after planting, say it's October, um, I get the radishes, they start coming up. And then I start harvesting the radishes, you know, around, you know, November. And then once the radishes are, as I'm pulling the radishes up, I'm actually making room for the carrots that are starting to now come up and having, you know, and they, they are starting to put their roots down. And so then you can actually plant many things all in one box at the same time and water them at the same time. This is, um, this, the, the official term for this is French intensive planting. But, you know, it's just like basically putting everything down at once. And then from their internal, um, from their internal clock, letting them sort of come up when they feel like. Next slide. So this is four months after planting, you see the peas. I transplanted the peas out, even though um, peas didn't do so well being transplanted out. I just, um, because this variety I accidentally planted, since I also didn't read the seed package, um, went up to eight feet high. I had to sort of get them a little bit, uh, some space to grow. And then five months after planting, you can see that the carrots have come up and the kale, we put in the kale after we took out all the radishes. And then this was sort of, um, towards the end of the planting season for the cauliflower. And if you can see at the, the second picture with the girl in the red jacket and next to the kale, which is the green leafy vegetable, that cauliflower is already starting to bolt or to spread out and then starting to flower because it's decided it's time to flower. Next slide. And so every time you plant a garden, um, you're planting food and food is delicious and you're very excited. Um, what they don't talk about is that because we love vegetables to eat so much and humans as a whole has cultivated vegetables to become tasty, full of sugar and very delicious, is that all of a sudden 
everyone around nature in the, the from the raccoons, the squirrels to the cockroaches, the ants, they were like, oh, well, we love to eat that too. <laughs> in fact, that's much better than whatever we were eating, um, the, the strawberry and other stuff that we were eating. And so pests are just animals that we compete with because, you know, if you, if you were in a situation where you were eating, you know, I don't know, something terrible like cardboard or something, and then all of a sudden someone offered you, uh, you know, a plate of lettuce, you know, really tender lettuce, you would obviously go be like, oh, I'm going to go eat the lettuce. And so when you start a garden, you do attract pests and that's okay. Um, it, it gives you a sense of, I was, it, it not only actually just, if you were scared of bugs, um, this is actually a great way to sort of confront that fear because first off, you know, as you're, as you're exposed to it, you'll just be like, oh, well, that's just a bug. That's fine. It's not going to hurt me. Um, the first thing to do when you're doing a garden because you are growing food is you don't want to immediately drop a bunch of pesticides on it. Pesticides are fine. Um, however, because they are toxic to pests, you, and, you know, you don't really want to expose your food to it. You want to minimize your food to it. Um, so there are three things. Uh, there's a three method that was developed. It's called integrated pest management. And it's a big term for just saying, do the least amount of damage to, um, to stop what you want for the most effect. You know, the first method is actually very just, you know, straight out physical method. You could plant in a different season. Like I talked about the spider mites. You'll plant in the winter so they're not as abundant. You can just take the branch off. So, you know, you can just prune, say there's a there's a branch that's covered in aphids. You can just prune it off or you can take a hose and just wash it off. Um, and of course, um, you can eat ugly fruit, <laughs> ugly vegetable. It's uh, It still tastes the same if it looks ugly. You just, you know, chop off the bits that you don't like. And uh, it's still the tomatoes. I've got some really funky tomatoes that, you know, they look terrible, but then once you cut off the funky bits, you know, they're, they're absolutely delicious, just as good as the heirlooms um, that you get from the shops. Um, the second one is biological. You can purchase, so everyone knows ladybugs. You can purchase ladybugs from this, from hardware stores and gardening stores, and they'll be happy to eat the, eat the aphids that you have. Um, for ladybugs, it's actually best to put them at the, um, when you release them, to release them at night. Because uh, if you release them in the morning, they tend to fly off and, you know, go to other people's houses to eat their aphids, which is great for them, but not good for you. Um, so at night, you tend to sort of give a little spray on your plants that have aphids and to dump the ladybugs on there at night and they'll sort of stay there. Um, there's other commercial predators like lacewings. There's a couple of ones where they're parasitic wasps that you can buy. Um, for biological, I found that sometimes just waiting and being lazy. Um, I often get results because as perhaps my neighbors are dumping ladybugs in the morning and all of a sudden, you know, my garden, because I didn't do anything with it, got a bunch of ladybugs and, you know, they ate all my aphids and they left. And so sometimes just waiting if you can. Um, it's never good the first year. The first year, you always get a lot of pests because the predators haven't figured out where the feast is. But, you know, by your third or fourth year of gardening, typically I have a bunch of birds in my house. And I did not realize this, but in order to raise a baby bird, um, the, the mother and father birds, they have to feed this baby bird over 6,000 caterpillars. And so once the birds moved into my house, I never had a problem with caterpillars anymore because in fact, it was like, I was trying to grow some caterpillars and I had to like shield them from the birds and I had to fight with them. You know, like, don't, don't touch these caterpillars, please. Um, so birds are fantastic at eating all your bugs. And then um, the only problems I have had is spider mites. And I have purchased these predator mites from the shops, um, Gardening shops will usually sell them to you. You can sometimes get them online. And I don't know if it really helps. Um, it kind of makes me feel better about it. That's about it. And the third one is if everything's just destroyed and you're just feeling 
rotten about I've tried it I've tried taking the leaves off I've tried spraying I've tried growing in a different season I've tried you know buying uh, biological predators is that you know you can use um, pesticides and they have a place in commercial situations and they have a place in they rarely have a place in domestic situations but you always want to start with the lowest toxicity you know organic pesticides before moving on um, unless you are growing some food that is extremely important or valuable to you that you must have succeed I would rarely use a pesticide that you know would be harmful to humans as well um, there are there are certain pesticides which are actually only harmful to um, to insects and not humans and I would go with those first before um, choosing a pesticide that has more toxicity to mammals especially if you have pets or small children in the house all right next slide uh, speaking about more organic pesticides, is there something you could plant that might deter um, insects from coming in? Is there like a plant or a flower that if an insect sees, they go like, oh, not here, and they move on? Or are they, do insects just love every plant? Oh, that's a great question. And um, yes, you can definitely plant um, not only plants that would deter insects, you can plant a sacrificial plant. Oftentimes, um, you'll notice that one one of your kale will have all the aphids and the other kale will be perfectly fine. Um, it's because once a plant is eaten by the bug, it, there's a chemical signal from that bug that tells all the bugs around it that say, oh, this is, this is good, this is fine, I'm not dying. And so then they sort of congregate there. Um, you can plant, a lot of plants have natural insect repellents. Um, I wouldn't say it's 100%, I would say like it's a, it's a minimal reduction but I was going to talk about um, planting flowers as well, is that in order to attract this biological predators, um, you can actually plant natives. And it's it's a fantastic way. It's a great cycle of not only making your garden more beautiful, but also sort of helping your gardening out. So I'll talk about it, I think, in the next slide, or maybe two slides down. And just really quickly, um, I'm looking at my window. I'm looking at um, some urban wildlife like squirrels? How do you uh -huh. um, push squirrels from, you know, feasting on your carrots and your <laughs> seeds and all that good stuff? Yeah, squirrels, um, they're adorable, but they're terrorists. <laughs> and so um, I, I've, I have had to use a physical barrier, which is um, I've had to use netting for my apples and I've had to use sort of this chicken wire for my tomatoes. But yes, they are they're relentless and they're very smart and they're very strong. So um, for squirrels, I I think as gardeners, we have a love-hate relationship where they're very adorable, but they they destroy gardens <laughs> like nothing else. So you have to have a physical barrier for squirrels. And nets and chicken wire work best. So there is a, uh, as I was talking about uh, uh, the question, there is a lazy patch for integrated pest management, which is to plant flowers. Um, many farmers are beginning, especially in England, are beginning to plant these hedgerows, which are just rows in between their crops mixed with flowers for wildlife. And then you get these insects that come by like wild bees, which are docile. So they don't, you know, if one landed on you and you smacked it, it, would, it wouldn't really sting you. And if it tried to sting you, it would be very, very gentle. They are not like the European bees where they attack, you know, to defend their queen because they, they don't have a hive. They're actually very, uh, they're singular. Um, animals. And also the bumblebees, they're actually much better pollinators. They buzz around and they um, they shake and they're really quite messy. So um, a lot of the a lot of the plants that need a lot of pollen, they tend to like prefer the wild bees. There's these beneficial wasps and they're too small. Sometimes if you look at a flower, there are these tiny, tiny things that look like flies and they're wasps. And they're too small to sting, but they they lay their eggs on caterpillars such as your tomato hornworms and you know they'll basically take care of your caterpillars as well of course ladybugs will come we all know that ladybugs are one of the um, predators praying mantises and oh i mentioned the birds they need to feed their young over 100 caterpillars in bugs a day and so they're they're fantastic if you plant flowers usually that those flowers will feed the the predators and then they'll come you know and take care of all the other problems that you have Oh, um, do I have, is it only one more minute left? Should I, I'll just go quickly towards the end. So there's questions. We, we, we got some time. 
Yeah. Okay. All right. Fine. All right. Next slide. And for California, we actually we have um, a variety of flowers, even though we in Los Angeles is typically a desert environment. There's a lot of drought tolerant, um, hardy flowers, which are really beautiful. They're gorgeous. Um, I have a couple in my yard that have served me so well because um, on the left, if you see the, the purple, um, the, the sort of purple lupin, these, these sort of pop up actually just along my street. Um, they're really drought tolerant and the one in the red box, those are buckwheat. They're big bushes about, you know, four or five feet. And I have never had to water them. And they provide the, they, their seeds provide food for the birds. Their flowers provide pollen and you know, nectar for the, for the bees and wasps. And, you know, just generally they're fairly resistant to almost every, I've never seen any pests on them at all. They're resistant to almost everything and they smell wonderful. And if you want something that smells extremely beautiful, the last one, which is on the right, there's this um, plant called the lilac verbena. And this has the most amazing smell that I've, it does smell like lilacs. And once again, there it's a very drought tolerant. I have one plant which is going on, they're perennials. So you don't have to take them out. So perennials are, you know, you, they stay year after year. Whereas annuals, you have to take them out and put in a new one each year. But these are perennials and they will, you know, I've got one that's about five or six years old and it's still going strong. Next slide. So where do I get these native plants? Um, we are in Los Angeles. We are in Sun Valley. It's We're actually very fortunate to have um, a shop called the Theodore Payne Foundation. He, uh, Theodore Payne was a man that went out into the fields of California and he gathered seeds and he categorized them and, you know, basically wanted people to plant native plants in their house, in their homes, because he thought they were so beautiful. And they have classes there. You can buy all these different natives that they sell to you. Um, my suggestion is to get two or three plants per year and try them out in your house, see if you like them. They are on the pricier side um, of plants. Oh, and then another way to obtain native plants is, you know, if you go on a walk, if you still guys still go on a walk during the pandemic, you know, as you're walking around your neighborhood, I've seen lupin just run wild and you can collect the seeds. And the neighbors are often very happy to give you plants, you know, if you wanted to get, I mean, I know that people come by and ask for succulents and I'm like, of course, you know, please help me garden <laughs> and uh, clean up my yard. And if you have a particular want, you can always ask the buy nothing or free cycle groups in your community. Oftentimes um, plants or other things will be offered up. Next slide. So a quick little shameless plug. We are actually planning a great event with the Theodore Payne Foundation in the fall. So keep an eye out for that one. It's going to be lots of fun. There might be some free plants given away or some free seedlings. So um, watch out for that um, coming up in the fall. We are getting requests. If you could please give us the names of the plants in this previous slide. Okay. Um, so the ones with the tall um, purple flowers, those are called lupin, L-U-P-I-N-E. And those are annuals. So they will, they'll grow and they'll set seed each year. Um, the second one in the middle with the red box is called a buckwheat. And um, just almost like the buckwheat flower, but it's a different buckwheat. It's a native buckwheat. And then the one to the right is called a lilac verbena. Uh, should I type it out? And you can send it, so I type it out in the chat. Let's see. Yeah, that would work. Open, buckwheat, and lilac verbena. And you can get all three of those at the theater pane. Foundation. And that's fantastic that Theater Pain is having um, having an event. I encourage you guys to attend that, especially if they're giving away free plants. Um, so I have a little bit of extra um, just to wrap up is that if you get your hands in gardening, you want to continue. And that is really one of the 
the most cost efficient way to stay healthy and be happy and, you know, learn kind of new things that are kind of cool and help the environment at the same time is that um, the second thing after you start planting and getting successful and getting carrots and cucumbers is that you're th you're like, oh, why do I keep buying, buying fertilizer and, and soil? It's getting kind of expensive, you know. I just want to buy the plants or I just want to buy the seeds. Is that you can start making compost. Um, I know LAWDP has encouraged green bins. Um, they even have these compost bins that they were giving out. And it's actually really, really easy. Um, there are different ways of composting and you can get as complicated, um, as high tech as you want, or you can do it, you know, very low tech and very lazy. Um, a really simple way is that if you have a plot of land, a small space is you can just dig a hole and you can fill it with your food scraps. And then if you want to sort of keep the squirrels and raccoons and possums out, you can either cover it with a board or, you know, a light layer of soil each week to avoid them. And then, you know, and after after six six months, you know, you've got a giant hole of compost. Um, there are compost bins, above ground compost bins, which are available at a discount from the LAWDP work workshops. There are worm bins. Worm bins, if you wanted to get compost very quickly, are amazing. Um, you can put a banana, you know, banana peel in there and then, you know, it's gone within a day. And they're very, very active. And then the above ground compost bin sometimes if you're you know i don't want to i don't want to do too much work i just toss all my stuff in and then i don't turn it and it's sort of slowly turned into a worm bin but if i need to compost very quickly i would just take my shovel and i would you know turn it more often um next slide so for compost it's the amount of work that you put in there is how quickly things will happen um, for a compost to really get going because it's actually a, the back there's a it's a bacterial process breaking down you know from all the cellular components into you know compost um, the more bacteria gets spread around the good bacteria the better it is that the more easily things will break down and so the more you turn you know as you turn the compost with your shovel and keep your compost moist, the quicker it turns from scraps to compost. Good things to put in your compost are vegetable scraps, leaves from your yard, paper, not too much of the bleach stuff. Um, you can put, you know, the ratio is usually, um, I think like 40%, 60%, 60% of the, you know, paper, and then the 40% of the, you know, wet stuff, vegetable scraps that have high nitrogen content. The wilted flowers, cardboard, you don't want to put meats, and manure from meat-eating animals, diseased or pest-covered plants. And it's not because they can't be composted. In fact, LAWDP does compost them in their large compost facility, I think near Griffith Park. Um, it's just that it's very, if you don't do it in a, in a very consistent manner, sometimes they will still be there. And then you don't want to put like disease uh, soil into your plants because then you're just kind of spreading it. Um, also, sometimes if you have weeds, um, if you don't kill the weeds through the, the composting process, they might just pop up again. Um, I think the Griffith Park facility actually does offer free compost. If you wanted to just sort of go there, um, it does its, I think it's a service to the community as a whole that you can get free compost. I think you have to bring, you know, you have to bring your own bag to put it in. So the signs of a healthy compost is that it smells like, you know, forest soil. So you can grab it, you hold it. It's, doesn't have a weird like sticky slimy look to it. If it does have a sticky slimy look to it, that usually means it has too much nitrogen. And what you do is just add more paper, you know, add more dried leaves, and then you just mix it again. Um, if it's not going, it looks like you know things aren't moving. It looks really dry. You just water it and put a little bit more uh, of the green compost, which is the vegetable scraps. If you have pests in it, that's why um, a compost bin. They have the compost bin is that it's very secure. You just want to make sure that there's, um, if you do have, say, rats or something, you want to sink it down a little bit more so that they can't dig under to get to it. Um, I've never had rats, but um, but yeah, that I guess if you if you secure it, most of the times you won't have a problem with that. If you have, you know, bugs, you know, those white grubs, those are actually fine. Um, they don't do anything. They're they're the larvae of those green fig beetles, and they actually like 
decompose your compost for you. Um, so that's actually not a problem. All right, next slide. So these are just pictures. Um, this is my first year gardening. And, you know, I was very careful. You can see everything was well arranged and, you know, very careful. And if you go to the next slide, you can see that as the years got on, um, there's a container garden. Um, I started planting more flowers. I started letting things go, like the broccoli. Um, you know, if you don't want to plant flowers, you can just let some of your vegetables go to flower. Broccoli is a fantastic flower to let bolt. Usually it's covered by bees and other animals, they love it. Um, it's really fun to watch as well if you have kids because you never think, oh, I'm eating, I'm eating this broccoli floret and it, it's actually like a hundred flowers. The next slide. And so thank you for um, having an interest in gardening. Thank you for coming to this talk. And gardening is, I mean, I have a personal passion for it, um, but I also feel like this is one of the things that you can do as an individual that really makes a difference because you're reducing your food waste by making compost. Um, you're usually most of the black bin and trash that you throw out, it is just, you know, food, right? It's vegetable scraps and other things like that, that you couldn't eat. And so you're reducing the amount of landfill that you're contributing to just by making compost that you'll use again in your garden. And you're planting food for humans instead of lawns. Um, you know, it's kind of fun to, even if you, so if you think about it, even if you didn't get, you know, a hundred pounds of tomatoes, you got some tomatoes, right? And so therefore you reduce the amount of water that, un, you know, had to be used to transport the tomatoes from, um, from a farm. And, you know, you got to sort of do the same thing, whereas you would have watered your lawn and not eaten, eaten any of, of your lawn. And it's a, it's a way to connect to nature while you're producing instead of being a consumer. And you're watching, you know, you're watching the cycle of life, which is kind of something that you don't think about too much as you're trying to, you know, get through your, get through your day. You're like, oh, you know, the seed goes and the whole job of the plant is actually to make more seeds. It's not actually to feed you. And so then as you learn more about it, you become, you're like, oh, wow, this is actually really, um, it's been a very, it's a very, uh, it's a very fun way to sort of realize what nature is trying to do and how to how you can help nature just by doing very very simple things and just like every day walking out and being like oh there's it's spring so therefore i see the caterpillars coming or it's summer and so i can see the tomatoes turning red all right next slide if you had any specific questions you can also email the master gardener helpline um, which is run by a very good team of master gardeners as well. So thank you for your time. Awesome. Thank you so much um, for joining us today and for this, this great talk. Um, I know I learned a lot. Um, I've done a little container gardening. Um, I don't have a yard, so I definitely put these in, uh, all these tips into use. So thank you so much um, for, for today's talk. Be sure to follow us on all the socials at LA County Library. Um, and I'll leave the last word to you. Thank you so much. And um, if you guys have any questions, I'll be around for about five minutes. Um, I'm happy to answer them for you. And, or if you can just email me, I'm also happy to respond. Perfect. Um, well, thank you so much again, everybody. Um, emails are there if you have any uh, specific questions uh, for any of the Master Gardeners. So once again, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, and we'll see you uh, next time. Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon.